so uh, welcome all here and online um, to uh, one more session of the um, uh, Agrarian Ch Change Seminars uh, for the Spring 2024. My name is Elena Perez Nino. I'm one of the editors of the Journal of Agrarian Change, and I'm also an assistant professor here at the ISS uh, in the Netherlands. Um, the Journal of Agrarian Change has been organizing this annual series uh, since 28, um, sorry, uh, 2008. And um, this uh, series became a uh, hybrid online and um, in presence um, after the pandemic. And so we've carried on with this method that has uh, worked very well for us. Uh, for those of you less familiar with the Journal of Agrarian Change, this is a journal for agrarian political economy that aims to promote the interdisciplinary investigation of social relations and dynamics of production, property and power in agrarian formations in their processes of change, both historical and contemporary. Uh, today's seminar is co-organized by the ISS in, at the, uh, the Institute of the Erasmus University in Rotterdam, devoted to the study of development studies. Um, and I'm joined here by co-organizers uh, such as Amor um, Shah from the Journal and Carlos Muyanga from SOAS. Uh, before we move um, to our guest today, I would also like to flag um, that this meeting will be recorded. So if you do not, do not want to be um, in the audio or in the video, uh, please keep your camera off and use the chat um, for comments and questions. Uh, now over to today's uh, seminar presented, uh, presenter, Dr. Yunan Shu. Yunan is a research associate with an ERC funded uh, project, uh, Russia's Five, here at the ISS um, and the project and Yunnan have been working on global land and commodity rush. Yunnan has a PhD in development studies from this very institution, the ISS, and a master's in natural uh, re resource management from Renmin University in China. Uh, her research examines, among other things, um, the journal, sorry, her research examines food system transformation within China and in China global interconnections. Yunnan has published among, uh, elsewhere in the Journal of Peasant Studies, Geoforum, Agricultural Human Value, Land Use Policy, and other journals, and is the author of a Routledge monograph, Industrial Tree Plantations and the Land Rush in China. The talk today is uh, entitled uh, The Political Economy of, Ag of the Agrochemical Complex in China. So, you know, you have 45 minutes and then we'll have questions both from the audience and from um, uh, those uh, watching online. And uh, so we look forward to a very lively um, discussion. Remember to type your um, questions if you want in the chat and um, otherwise raise your hand uh, physically or online uh, after, you know, during the Q&A session. Thank you and over to you, you know. Yeah, thanks a lot, Hannah. And, uh... Hello everyone, uh, thanks a lot for coming and thanks a lot for inviting me to give uh, my research, to give a presentation on my research about the political economy of agrochemical complex in China. And this is a collaborative work between me and Yi Yuan Chen from China Agricultural University. And uh, today I would like to present from from four parts. First, I will briefly introduce about the background, then I will give an overview of the literature and give a discussion about the uh, trajectory of China's agrochemical industrial development and uh, in a, finally I will briefly discuss about this analysis. <clears throat> Firstly, currently agriculture tends to be increasingly dependent on agrochemicals according to the data of FAO and there is about a 90% increase of the world's uh, pesticide use from 2019, uh, 1990s to 2020. And uh, this might be still an underestimation such increase, uh, considering that FAO data set is incomplete, as already pointed out by some critical scholars. <clears throat> About the agrochemical, there's a lot of discussions 
Um, some scholars believe that uh, uh, every, uh, chemical use is necessary, considering that um, um, pesticides help the farmers to grow more food on less land by protecting crops from the pets, disease and weeds. And they even point out that without the use of pesticides, there will be a 78% loss of the fruit production, 54% uh, <clears throat> loss of vegetable production, and a 32% loss of the fruit production. Uh, of 32 percent loss of the cereal production, while other scholars, critical scholars, have pointed out that the key issue among the uh, food security is not about is not only about producing more, but also about the distribution. Beyond such uh, hot debates, the pesticides, agrochemicals, do bring um, significant health and environmental risks, as listed here. Some key facts that currently 48% of global agricultural land is at risk of the pesticide pollution and one third of the cereal production in, the, uh, in Europe has, has uh, tested with the, um, pesticide residues and over half of all the food samples tested by the US Food and Drug Administration can be uh, tested with the um, pesticide residues. In this sense, the critical question is how and how much pesticides chemicals are used for agriculture is uh, very closely associated with the future of our food system and uh, the uh, planetary health, including the concerns about the environment degradation and uh, health risks. Mm, so, to uh, explore the dynamics of the agrochemicals, it's important to, for us to find a pathway to sustainability. Within the agrochemical complex, the job of China is very crucial, considering it's the major, if not the number one, producer, exporter, consumer of the pesticides globally. Meanwhile, the Chinese companies tend to take the lead in the global pesticide market, as shown in the table here. Uh, we can see that uh, in 2020, that there are three Chinese companies now is among the top 10 agrochemical uh, companies worldwide. And uh, they, these three account for around 30% of the total market share already. So it mean, means that exploring the uh, political economy of agrochemicals in China and the China's role in the global agrochemical market is very significant. It's very important. <clears throat> um, to study to to as initial exploration of this agrochemical complex in China. Oh, we conducted a systematic review of the articles on China's agrochemical complex published in the Web of Science uh, and the CNKI in both English and Chinese from the year to uh, na na 1990s to the February 2013 in both English and uh, Chinese and we um, this study includes the studies that are purely technical and uh, engineering. And here is the outcome of our selection. And uh, the figure on the right shows that the category of our search outcomes. As we can see here clearly, that majority of the selected studies focus on the factors that affect the pesticide use of, uh, in China. Um, but this study tends to attribute attributes the usage of the chemical in China to only one or, or several factors, uh, including the farm size and uh, the uh, farmer's perspectives. Um, this, for example, there are 20 papers that study the relationship between the farm size and the pesticide usage in China and highlights the importance of the farm size supported by statistic analysis. 
And this paper, many of this paper concluded that rural land consolidation and uh, farm size uh, expansion would contribute to the reduction of the pesticide use in China and the green transformation there. Meanwhile, there are also some studies that focus on the simplified uh, management reno innovations such as certification, crop uh, insurance, cooperatives, or technology innovations such as a biological uh, control practice and how this innovation have a role in the reduction of the pesticide uh, use in China. However, I, we argue that such certification Simplification ignores the political economy roots of the pesticide use in China and the power relations around such complex. And at the same time, there are some studies focus on the domestic situ status of the pet pesticide dynamics in China as both macro and micro level. As a macro level, studies include the temporal and the spatial uh, trends of domestic pesticide trends uh, and um, usage in China and related uh, or related policy shift in China. As a macro level, there is a study analyzing the peasant dependence on the pesticides use based on the ethnographic study at the village level in China. Furthermore, there are over 30 studies focused on the negative environmental and health impacts of the agrochemical usage. However, we argue that these studies is not sufficient to fully capture the complex at the national level and also it lacks a global view given the fact that agrochemical complex internal to China is shaping and shaped by the global dynamics. And to in short, uh, we argue that the complicated power relations around the China's uh, agrochemical complex are largely ignored in the current literature. And the current analysis is too fragmented along the historical axis. And the majority of the studies are too focused on China and the sector per se, while ignoring the impacts of the global complex and the interconnection between the, uh, the, the agrochemical sector and other related sectors, for example, food and the infrastructure sector, which I will uh, elaborate a little bit more later. So this is so our current understanding of the agrochemical complex in China is not sufficient. To partly address the gap within our uh, understanding, we offer an overview of the trajectory of China's agrochemical industrial uh, sector in China. As shown here, this three graph actually shows the trajectory and <clears throat> on the uh, pesticide use in density, agricultural um, use of pesticide and export of the pesticides. And uh, clearly, uh, we are, uh, through these figures, we can identify there are four stages of the agrochemical sector development in China, namely the initial stage before the late 1980s, where there's low usage, low export, and there's a rising stage with increasing usage, low export. The expansion stage with uh, since uh, from the early 2000s to the early 2010s with increasing usage and increasing exports and uh, the restructuring stage after the mid 2020s with decreasing usage and for, for infrastructure uh, inf, uh, and the fluctua flat, fluctuating export and the first uh, the initial stage before the late 1980s uh, in the initial stage, the USA and the European countries dominate the industry and the whole sector in China is still in its infancy. And in the rising stage, on the demand side, the emerging outflow of the labor from rural to urban areas in China lead to a significant increase in the pesticide use in agricultural sectors. On the supply side, that the pesticide market become gradually formalized and liberalized 
um, as shown uh, in the table here with the series policy shifts. Uh, this is um, um, the policy change that we summarized uh, in this period. And along with uh, this policy change, many domestic private companies started to engage in the pesticide sector. Meanwhile, the Chinese government also increased the uh, research and development expenditure at this time. But at this stage, most of the research and development is focus on cheap ways of the, uh, making the agrochemicals and uh, developing formulas based on the off-pattern active ingredients instead of uh, developing new active ingredients in China. In this same period, there's globally, there's a concentration trend in the market in the agrochemical market within this trend many big companies including Syngenta, DuPont and Bell started to, be, to build their plants all over the world to seek for the cheap production and the easy access to the market including China because China's uh, low wage cost lacks environment regulations and also the potential markets there and <coughs> Later, in the expansion stage of during the early 2000s and, um, and also early 2010s, um, on the supply chain side, with further marketization, uh, there's the uh, mushroom private companies in China uh, get engaged in the pesticide industrial, although many of these uh, companies are uh, private owned and a small scale. And on the demand side, there's a soaring demand um, in China uh, during this period due, due to the four key reasons, including the drop in the pesticide price affected by the global market and uh, the increasing shortage of labor in rural areas, the trend of the land consolidation, the diet transformation and the promotion of a localized uh, network. To be specific, that firstly, the pesticide price uh, dramatically decreased in the early 2000s. This is closely associated with uh, successively um, expiration of the patents and also uh, the uh, slowdown of the innovations of the big uh, agrochemical companies at this stage due to the uh, more strict environmental uh, policies of the world. Secondly, there's the rising pesticide in China is also related to the increased rural and urban migration. Uh, on the one hand, um, the, due to the rural, massive rural and urban migration, there's a huge shortage of labor in, um, for farming practice. This increased the demand of the agrochemical inputs to in place of the manual labor to uh, protect the pro crops from the weeds, pests and other bacteria. On the other hand, the income that uh, they can gain from the migration actually did uh, support them to purchase, support the villagers purchase and use of the agrochemical inputs including the fertilizer and the um, pesticides for farming at home. And the third, that the, with the trend of the land consolidation in the 2000s, um, the large, there, there emerged um, many large farms operated by the big household they call it Dahu in China and the collectives and the specialized companies. Um, these large farms are usually uh, cultivate commercial crops in a large scale monoculture, standardized and industrialized way. And thus, they are essentially pesticide dependent. And the first factor is about the changing food consumption pattern in China caused by the rise of the middle class in urban areas underlying the far, uh, rapid uh, urbanization in China. And this will further lead to changes in farming practice towards more uh, usage of the uh, chemical inputs because compared with um, the traditional grain crops, 
in China, the vegetable and uh, fruits are high pesticide consumption crops. So the land use change from the uh, staple food to, con to the cultivation of the vegetables and fruits actually lead to more usage of the pesticide in rural China. And fifth, the localized cell network of pesticides was transformed in China from the, uh, the agricultural extension system at the county and the township level in the collective times. So this is deeply rooted at the local level and many of the retailers at the township and the county levels in rural China, they are villagers per se. And um, during the, uh, and these retailers usually employ the villagers, usually the village elites to sell the um, chemical, uh, agrochemicals in the villages. Uh, at the same time, they also provide the free trainings for farming, uh, for farmers uh, to, uh, to use the agrochemicals. This kind of training do promote the usage of the chemical inputs in farming. Such knowledge transfer at the local level um, does contribute to the dismantling of the traditional farming methods. Uh, to the construction of a new pathway of farming uh, that is highly dependent on the uh, chemical inputs. Except for the domestic demand, a large part of the produced pesticide or export after the China's join of the WTO in 2001, uh, China's asset export increased swiftly. And this was related to China's low cost of production and the less environmental regulation and the favorable tech policy during this period. As a result, China became the world's largest cheap uh, supply of cheap active ingredients in the global pesticide market at this time. <coughs> Later in the restructuring stage, uh, since 2010, China started to shift the focus to the environmental sustainability, including the green transformation in agriculture uh, after the the emergence of multiple food safety crises in China during the 2000s, during the period of 2000s. Aligned with the trend of the uh, green transformation, there's a series of policy shifts in agriculture. Here, as we uh, as summarized in the table here in 2005, there's um, action to achieve their growth in the use of ke chemical fertilizer and pesticide by 2020 uh, launched by the uh, Chinese uh, Agricultural Ad uh, Administration Administry and uh, aiming at reducing the agriculture use uh, of chemical inputs and uh, matched with such action a more strict regulation on the control of the agricultural chemicals was also launched in 2017. Such state-directed green transformation is also partly related to Chinese companies' attempt to upgrade from a cheap active ingredients producer to a high value formulation developer and uh, producer in the value chain of the global agrochemical industry because producing the active ingredients is more uh, polluted compared with the production of the formulation. And as shown uh, in this table here that at this moment the in the global market the international the big uh, international agrochemical giants, big companies, they actually at this moment also face great challenges due to the intensified competitions of the uh, generic firms from the south, including in those companies in China and in India, and also the high recent development barriers due to the more strict uh, environment policies globally and uh, more uh, cost, increased cost for the research and development. Uh, so as a result, 
the Chinese company is that you take the lead in the global agrochemical industry through a series of the uh, merchant acquisitions, as shown in the table here. You can see the change. There was non-Chinese companies uh, in 2009, and they are already three and account for about 30% in 2020. In addition to the market restructuring, the development of the pesticide industry in China is and were further shaped by some other factors, including the Bad Road Initiative and the shift of the China's GMO policy. Under the Bad Road Initiative, the, the physical connectivity is uh, increased through the construction of infrastructure, and such uh, physical connectivity is closely associated with the trade. As it shown in the table here, that um, the BI partner countries of China uh, are key destination for the China's pesticide exports. And uh, regarding to the GMO seed development, different from the trajectory of other countries where the, the pesticide, or especially the herbicide selling, is packaged, usually packaged with a certain herbicide resistant GMO seeds. Um, we, um, and because uh, in China the rise of the pesticide use has little relationship between the GMO seeds in the past because China is uh, taking the route of firstly non-food, then indirect food feed, finally food to commercialize the GMO seeds. Aligned with the seed between, um, before 2000, the only commercialized seed in China was BT cotton. And in 2021, the action plans uh, for seed industrial revitalization was launched. And, and this largely promotes the GMO seeds uh, development in China. After this, several GMO feed crops, including the herbicide resilient, resist, resistant GMO maize and the soybean seeds, got commercial commercialization permission. This means that herbicide resistant GMO seeds are expect to widely used in China afterwards. This will largely promote the use of certain brands of the herbicide uh, in China, which will shape the development of the whole industrial, not only in China, but also globally. So, combined with the uh, systematic literature review, with the uh, initial analysis of the uh, dynamic of the agrochemical sector in China above, we argue that our current understanding cannot fully capture the trajectory of the agrochemical industrial development in China. Mm, the agrochemical complex in China has its political economic roots, but it's not self-sustaining. Instead, the China's agrochemical complex is embedded in a broader system. Historically, the agrochemical complex is embedded in the historical process of the agro-transformation linked with land labor dynamics and farming practice. And, and actively, the agrochemical complex in China is embedded in the China global interconnection. In other words, um, to understand the, what happened in China, cannot, uh, in order to fully understand the agrochemical complex in China, should understand, also understand the interconnection between the China and the global complex interconnection. And, and sexually, the agrochemical complex is embedded in the intersexual interconnections. Um, for example, the development of the infrastructure and the, the transformation in the food and the environmental sectors do shape, uh, do shape the development, the trajectory of the agrochemical uh, development in China. In this, to fill the current knowledge gap requires a more comprehensive framework to understand China's agrochemical complex historically and actively and interconnectively. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Yunnan, for that very, very provocative and um, truly uh, eye-opening presentation. And 
never in my mind thought that uh, pesticides in China could be so interesting. Um, we will open, obviously, the floor to questions uh, from the audience. Uh, please feel free to type them. Uh, perhaps <coughs> while you're thinking about them, I can uh, use the time for my own question, unless somebody here as well um, has one. Um, so, you know, you gave us a lot of uh, material for a range of discussions, but I was uh, really impressed at uh, the ability of this uh, paper to connect uh, things that we not necessarily see connected, especially at the level of the literature and, and in a literature review, um, which is on the one hand, uh, how the process of Chinese structural transformation and migration, which is really a labor question or partly a labor question, becomes an agrochemical <coughs> question when, agro as I see it from, from my perspectives, agrochemicals are the solution to the, um, uh, uh, to the uh, pressures to lower the uh, amount of labor utilized in agriculture. And that's quite fascinating because I think that process that has taken place in China um, is sort of like a mirror in which the rest of the world looks at itself and it has obviously happened in a more accelerated manner and more rapidly in China. But um, it's a process that uh, we verify in every other geography of the world. And so what are the implications uh, as China becomes a main player in the agrochemical sector? And I must say in other uh, subsectors, not only agrochemicals, but also very important in fertilizers. And as you clearly are pointing to um, in seed and innovation and kind of, uh, seed technology development, what are the implications of um, kind of like China uh, experimenting first uh, domestically, but now being in a great place to profit from the fact that uh, uh, inevitably uh, agriculture will become more agrochemically de de uh, dependent insofar as um, the share of population in agriculture is tending to fall in most uh, countries of the uh, global south. So I think the implications for like you know, global development studies and global uh, agrarian political economy are plentiful and are very, um, I think, make, make for a very exciting moment to be studying these um, dynamics uh, for young people starting their, their research. <coughs> Do you want to take that question and then we follow with other questions? Um, so, actually, you're asking, can I clarify a little bit? You're asking about the interconnection issue. Well, I'm thinking that this process that you've described for China applies oh. to many other geographies, especially in the Global South, or predominantly in the Global South. And uh, what is different now is that China is clearly positioning itself and Chinese firms in the agrochemical um, sector very, very strongly and very interestingly, no? uh, through these uh, mergers and acquisitions. So I'm just... Uh, trying to pick up your mind in terms of uh, what the implications may be of um, if, you know, if indeed um, the hypothesis that you propose, which I find very uh, provocative and very um, uh, plausible, uh, that uh, the uh, tendency towards uh, um, uh, lowering of the shares of the share of population working in agriculture will mean that uh, sustaining agricultural and export-led agriculture will require a far more input intensive type of agriculture. What will it mean for the world that these inputs will most uh, largely come from China? And what will it mean for Chinese uh, sort of like industrial strategy? Because, you know, agrochemicals are part of uh, China's uh, industrial strategy. Mm. Oh, this is a very big question. And I will try to, uh, because, um, because according to my knowledge on this, um, agrochemical um, sector is because China has a very important role in, nowadays in the global agrochemical uh, as I have shown here in the companies and through the exports um, but but uh, if we look at the overall economy structure that it is it is not that significant in the in the whole of uh, China's GDP um, uh, structure but I but I think this is uh, if we don't just look at the quantity of the uh, money or return of this sector per se, 
uh, it is still a very important sector because this sector links the rural and the urban and the China and the global significantly. As I have shown here, China is a key export and uh, the agrochemical, the type of agrochemical it export uh, linked, package, usually the agrochemical um, pesticide is linked with the training. Normally, I think not only in China but also globally, with the sales of the uh, agrochemical is also linked with the transformation of the pra farming practice. It's always the retailers will always offer the trainings to dismantle the old farming practice and in order to build a new path of the farming, in order to uh, to make the farming more dependent on the pesticides, always a strategy. Although maybe in different countries they do differently, but this is a common logic. So I think um, this kind of export were shaping the other countries' farming practice and further affect those, um, those people who are not do farming but eat the food. So, like I said, the health and the environment, so it will affect everyone. So I think this is a very important sector in this sense. Thank you so much. We have a question in the chat. I wonder, Thomas, if you want to ask um, this question out loud or shall we read it? We're happy to do either. Okay, perhaps someone you would want to read it? Oh uh, yeah, I, it's uh, Thomas's question is, uh, uh, could you tell us about your take on China developing GM soybeans while the Heilongjiang still profits? So would you like to comment on Chinese development of GM soybeans in a period in which still their use is perhaps not allowed? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Thanks a lot. Mm, I, I, my personally, I didn't do empirical studies in Heilongjiang, but um, in order to respond to this, I think it's very uh, useful to look at the China state society in the connection that might be an uh, answer to this question. Because in China, um, the state, when we talk about state, it's actually layered. We have the central state and the local state, the provisional level and the local level. And uh, usually when a state have a policy, like it's all, all, always a, a kind of directive policy, but at the lo local level, it will have different implement implementation strategy depend on their different uh, position in maintaining the both the capital accumulation and the maintaining social sustainability. Um, I assume this outcome is also kind of this kind of balance the different uh, state, uh, central, local state in connection state society interconnection is an outcome of this. But I also, and as I see the, as I also introduced the GMO uh, seed policy from a central state is only released in 2021. And it's only as, still at the starting stage. And I can, I also read a lot of reports about the uh, resistance um, in different ways to against this from the below. I assume that in order to respond to this kind of resistance, the government, especially the local government, might take different actions. As you can see, that maybe in some provinces still maybe not open the market for this. But I think this is a dynamic process, and I do believe this will um, changing and under this interconnection. This is my own take on this question. Thank you so much, uh, Yunan. I see that we have uh, 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 Christoval K who's raised his hand. Chris, could you please open your microphone and ask your question? Thank you very much. Um, um, and thanks first for your very clear presentation. And I very much agree with your conclusions. The analysis of all these interconnections, it's a very rich analysis in that sense. But you also very clearly emphasized at the beginning that many of the studies ignore power relations. And I think I would like you to expand a bit more about this issue of power relations in relation to this agrochemical transformation in Chinese agriculture. I'm particularly thinking about what can you say as to us about the development or the activities of uh, agroecological movements in China. Is there any reaction within civil society or within the farming community or within certain urban sectors who are worried about this trend and are campaigning for healthy food, you know, against the environmental degradation and so on. 
So what can you tell us about what is the reaction of civil society and particularly of agroecological movements against this increasing trend, as uh, Elena was already pointing out, that this trend seems to be ever, ever increasing, given the increasing commodification of agriculture, increased agricultural exports and so on, you know, and the lack of labor, that the pressures go into more agriculture, but there might be also counter pressures. So I want to hear more about these counter movements against this trend and what chance do they have? Can you enlighten us a bit about this? Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for your questions. Um, uh, firstly, I want to uh, clarify that this is a starting uh, period of a project. So this is more an overview paper. And I point out the power relation is lacking in our current understanding of this agrochemical complex in China. And uh, one of the aim of our future project is to fill this gap with the framework I proposed here. So my answer today might be incomplete uh, because it's still ongoing and we are doing, still doing research. But based on my current knowledge, I would like trying to answer your questions that um, yes, uh, as I briefly also mentioned in the in the structure uh, in the presentation that since 2010, uh, the state kind of started to promote the green uh, agriculture in China, green transformation of agriculture in China. This is partly associated with the multiple food crisis, food safety crisis in China in the early 2000s. There's a lot of uh, famous like the milk powder uh, crisis and uh, different like the egg crisis in China. And in response to this, there do have a lot of initiative from below in different forms. But um, uh, some like, for example, uh, after that, there's a lot of emergence of the, the alternative food scheme, uh, food supply scheme, schemas like the uh, community support uh, agriculture and uh, the peasant farm. Um, but uh, according to my understanding, this initiative uh, cause a lot of tension, especially in academia. And there's a lot of papers have written on this uh, alternative schemes and how this might shape the uh, food system in China and also might have a role in globally. But uh, this still only happen in a smaller scale and only to certain, um, certain how to say, uh, targets. I mean, the products of those kind of uh, schemes is only supports the middle class and it's still very expensive and also the um, labor, like the food labor schemes also started to become very prevalent afterwards. But um, I, I do think there should be more things, uh, more, uh, more initiatives should uh, do to in response to this and uh, I think this is something I should study and uh, write to in response to your question. Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat, oh. but I also see that uh, uh, Yang Xiao Hui has uh, the hand up. So could you please open your microphone, ask your questions, and then we'll read the questions in the in the chat. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Xu, for your a very insightful and interesting talk today. And actually, I have two questions. Should I say it one by one or uh, I say it together um, at first? Yeah. Yes. Um, so maybe I just say it all together. Um, so the first question is that uh, um, if there are, there's a trend of more openings of tree and products in China, and if this is the case in the future, uh, what do you think um, there will be, what do you think uh, will bring about new changes in the agrochemi agrochemical uh, industry in China and also in the world? And my next question is that, um, and because you mentioned earlier that um, there has been uh, expansions and rise of private enterprises in China in the um, uh, um, in the, in the past. Um, so uh, my question is that: Do you think this is still the case um, in the current China that there is more uh, rising private um, capital, or do you think that? Um, 
the state owned enterprises is taking over again in the in the current China. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I, I want to clarify. The first question is about the opening of what? Sorry, I missed your question. The opening of GM um, modified yeah. products, so like BT cotton and stuff. Yeah. Uh, genetically modified products. Yeah. <clears throat> I will uh, firstly start. Thanks a lot for your question. I will firstly start with the easier question, the second one, <laughs> and then the first one. And uh, the first one is about the expansion of uh, the role of the private companies. As I said, that's um, uh, after the liberalize of the uh, the uh, agrochemical. Uh, production in China, uh, a lot of uh, 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 private companies, especially small scale companies, started joining. This is uh, linked with the feature, as I said at the beginning, China is the world's uh, supplier of cheap active ingredients, of pet, of, usually of pattern uh, active ingredients. For this, uh, for this kind of uh, active cheap active ingredients, those small scaled uh, ones can. Uh, better able to achieve the cheap labors. So, so this is one of the reasons at the beginning it is mushroom, the small scale ones. Oh, and also, as I also show here that in the top, uh, in the top 10 global agrochemicals, there are three uh, in China, according to my understanding. Um, besides the Shenzhen, how is this, um, uh, is based on the share of the uh, Camel China and um, uh, Sino Camel, which is state owned companies. But the others, like the Shandong Wei Fang Rainbow Chemical Companies, is a private company itself. It's, uh, so, so I do think it is not only state-owned companies in this industry, but also private companies also have an important role in, uh, in, this, um, in this market. Although I see there's also in China, there's a, a trend of concentration of the companies, like big companies, they merge the small companies. But I do think this is more like um, a capital development process, the concentration. This is my understanding. Yeah, and uh, your second question is about the, uh, what's my opinion about the opening of the GMO seeds and how it will change the agrochemical industry in China and globally. I think this is a very uh, challenging question. I, will, I don't know whether I will, uh, my answer will be a right one, but um, I do see, as I briefly mentioned, that the GMO seeds, especially those um, herbicide resistant because according to the, because I am not good at predicting the future, but if we look at the history of the, what happened in other countries, like the trajectory of the agrochemical complex in other countries, the GMO seeds, especially the uh, herbicide resistant, resistance uh, seeds, were largely promote the sale of the herbicides. And uh, this is what I see in other countries. So my assumption, but I, it might be, it, but it might be wrong. My hypothesis is that with uh, a widely use of the GMO seeds, where promote the use of certain brand of the um, herbicides. This will further lead to the concentration of the capital power, and uh, the uh, per, then the production. Or uh, then this will lead to the production more uh, centralized. In this way, will shape the no both domestic and. Uh, global industry. This is my understanding. But the time will verify where, where, where this is right or wrong hypothesis, whether China has its own trajectory. Thank you so much. Um, let's take a couple of uh, questions from the chat because uh, they have been waiting. I'll, I'll read them out loud. Um, so first, uh, Bupendra is wondering about uh, Chinese agrochemical complex in the background of its planning for urbanization of rural China and what implications could this have on other rural contexts of the global south? Um, shall I read another one? Oh, you can, can you read uh, again? Sorry, okay. I missed it. Yeah, Bupendra is wondering about um, uh, how does the Chinese uh, agrochemical complex relate to uh, the planification or the planning for the urbanization of rural China? and whether this may have implications for other contexts, other rural contexts in the global south. You mean is the, the urbanization? Is there, a, is there a connection between 
um, the Chinese, the development of the Chinese agrochemical complex and strategies for the urbanization of rural China. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm a little bit confused. Uh, Karim, um, if those specialists are on that questions uh, on the urbanization or the uh, rural development in China, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, according to my understanding, there is never clear strategy of urbanization in China because it's more like a automatic or spontaneous happening. In China, the current policy is rural revitalization rather than rural urbanization. I don't think it's a strategy uh, intended by the state to make the rural urbanization, but they want to maintain the rural, but to make it more revitalized. Mm -hmm. This is the strategy. Mm, but I. Uh, in this context, I would like to say that the agrochemical development sector is a very important link in this rural vitalization because it is affects the uh, farming practice and also linked with the land and the labor conditions in China under the, as you say, the fast urbanization in China and how the uh, how we can uh, revitalize the urban and also the land consolidation project involved in the real rural vitalization process. Uh, so I think this is one of the link they think would be, I think many of the uh, scholars or the policymakers would think as a response the, a mechanization, industrialization of agriculture would be a response to uh, maintain the rural vitalization. This is my answer to this. But correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Great. I see there's a question uh, from Bridget O'Loughlin. Bridget, would you like to um, ask your question out loud? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you well. Um, because I, I skipped a word. Uh, otherwise, uh, so it's, it's helpful to say it out loud. Um, it's a naive background question. I don't know how um, agricultural markets work currently in China, um, you know, with the relationship between markets and policy. Um, so, but I wanted to ask only about the agrochemical producers. Um, how are input and output prices to agrochemical production units set in China, do these vary between regions? And how much are they influenced by world market prices? So it's really the profile of the political economy of the agrochemical industry. Um. Yes, uh, thanks a lot for your question. And uh, according to my understanding, that in China, because the uh, chemical, uh, chemical pesticide, particular chemical pesticides, is largely made of the fossil fuels. So, according to my knowledge, um, this kind of uh, price is largely affected by the global price of the fossil fuels, like the coin and uh, the oil. The, so this is a, a lot of pr producers we interviewed, they say uh, their price is largely influenced by the raw materials they can get. And also, um, I, I, I didn't do a very, at this stage, I didn't do a very empirical uh, analysis of the, to compare different uh, um, province the price of the of the pesticide sale according to my uh, only little uh, currently empirical field work that the retailers from the local because each big companies they were set the sell their sell their product to the locals through the through the uh, retailers at the local level as I said built on the 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 county and uh, township um, uh, station. Uh, really rooted, and uh, they were used. Uh, they were used uh, the the, uh, the villagers, village uh, athletes to sell it. It is a very uh, ru rural rooted process. So, according to my interview, in different regions, there's the price can is very marketized. It is not like the every place have the same price. 
and uh, even to promote the youth in some regions there they usually have the sales of the pesticide or fertilizers so in some events in the market events it's very marketized process and in some villages in some village household i interviewed they stored like they even have their room only store the fertilizer and the pesticide they purchase in the event because it's very cheap as the events they sales so they bought a lot and they store there in a room and uh, which is very surprised and uh, so i do think it will vary between different regions and uh, according to the market. But there's no intervention domestically or at province level on the uh, retail prices of, of pesticides? According to my current understanding, I think it's still very liberalized the market. Oh, okay. And also the competition, because I say a lot of small scale companies involved in the process, due to the competition, the price is very low actually. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Medina, you have a question. I wonder if you'd like to ask your question or shall I read it for you? Um, sure, yeah. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Medina. I'm from Dublin City University and I'm uh, studying smallholder farms in Uzbekistan. Uh, but I am also interested in what's happening in China because it's, um, I mean, a big player in Uzbekistan. Um, I'm mainly interested in like, um, maybe it's a slightly kind of confused question because I'm not fully sure about like the kind of land size structure in China but I am aware that there are many small farms and also a lot of, and I'm not sure what cattle is fed with because I'm sure that cattle production is also quite big in China. So I'm not, I'm, I'd like to maybe ask how, I'm interested in dis disaggregating like farm times and farm types and land size types by um, uh, pesticide use. So for example, our smallholder farms like, you know, like, do they use pesticide differently than like big state farms? Um, if you could expand on that, um, that would be um, helpful. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your question. Actually, this is a very interesting question, and this is also the motivation of my study. Uh, this agrochemical complex in China. Firstly, I will give you a brief answer. Uh, smallholders in China, actually they use chemicals and sometimes even more than less skill producers, which is very surprising. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, the, one of the motivation I started this is uh, when I discussed with my colleagues here, I started about the small skill uh, land investment, informal land investment of Chinese farmers, they go across the border and they produce in other countries, for example, in Russia or Southeast Asia. And uh, uh, in, in the local newspapers, always claim that Chinese farmers, they produce in very uh, chemical uh, intensive way, very polluted, they were pollute the land. But in Chinese newspaper, when they interview the Chinese um, farmers who go across the broad to produce, they say, I think I, when I produce in other countries, I have to uh, follow the local environmental rule, which is very strict. So I use actually uh, fewer chemicals um, compared with my farming at home. And, uh, and I, I start to answer my question, to ask myself why, because the small scale farming is always like champion as uh, uh, more, they use, usually use more agroecological way of producing, but why small scale China, uh, or farmers in China, they produce even in a more chemical intensive way. And during my interview myself in southern China, and uh, I did realize they produce in a very environment unfriendly way. One of the farmers, they told me that when, because my PhD research about eucalypt trees, and when they plant trees, they, they say, um, I will put the fertilizer in a raining day and uh, on the top of the hill and, and I put a lot so I don't need to do a lot of work I just put it there and the rain will um, put the fertilizer <laughs> down and, uh, and I feel very surprised why and uh, so that's the motivation I studied what is the political economic reason why they are starting to dependent on the uh, chemical outputs instead of more traditional agrochemical way what what matters dismantle their pra uh, traditional practice and I find it's very interesting this is the original motivation I started this research itself at the beginning and I hope I can give more concrete method after I finish this project because I said it's the beginning and I will do more empirical studies in the future to, to find more answers to answer these questions. 
It seems very clear to me that it's a labor saving <coughs> technology and therefore this is a political economy question. Uh, unless we have, oh yes, we have a question <coughs> here from the floor. Yes. Uh, so my interest is actually in this uh, overuse of peasants. And it has been mentioned a couple of times in the previous questions. So I want to further this discussion a little bit. So uh, we have acknowledged that the overuse of uh, chemical agrochemicals is very prevalent in China. Yeah, and do you think uh, there's uh, like maybe like the political economy motivation behind it, maybe from the producers, from the, the, the local governments? The, for example, they have salesmen across uh, counties, across villages. Uh, and from my side, I, I know that, for example, the peasants, uh, they feel like uh, they only need to use a certain amount of uh, agrochemicals to uh, maintain the produce, uh, maintain the amount of produce they want. Otherwise, they will uh, feel they, they will fear that it will harm their uh, yields. Yeah, so I just want to yeah pick your brain and see your take on it. Um, I uh, as I briefly mentioned uh, it's, uh, um, before, I think one of the um, I think it's very complicated uh, uh, question because it has very. Uh, um, not only one, but the different factors playing together to make this kind of dependent on the agrochemical use, ideology and the knowledge. And also from my background, I do see the labor land conditions have a role in this process combined with um, uh, because uh, uh, after the household responsibility system, the land is distributed to rural household, but it's small plots. And uh, also during the faster uh, rapid urbanization in China, they, the farmers do have the more opportunities to uh, wage work opportunities in urban areas. Um, under this uh, context, there's a labor shortage in rural areas, and agrochemical uh, uh, uses actually do partly, at least partly, um, uh, at least uh, fill the gap of the labor. As I said, so this is one of the reasons, but also there's also the promotion of the local government and also the companies, as you say, the very uh, localized sales network to promote the whole process, to build the ideology that our production is only dependent on the, on the chemical. If I didn't use it, I will have a huge loss, this kind of ideology. Yeah. We have uh, another question from the floor, um, but we are, you're in, sitting in the part of the floor that <coughs> cannot uh, be captured by the camera. So could you speak very loudly, please? Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for your presentation. I would like um, to know, what do you think about the effect of agrochemical for the human health? Sorry, are you the, uh, the, the impacts? Impact, the, or the impacts of the agrochemical? Today or for the human health, what do you think? Uh, for, for, for this question, because I'm not expert on the health, and um, as I have briefly shown, according to my some background search, the agrochemical use of causes um, have two kinds of impacts on the human health. Why for the, I think it's more serious for the workers, I mean the farm workers who actually uh, directly touch or expose on the environment of the, uh, when they uh, spray the pesticides or use uh, agrochemicals. I think this is more serious and more direct. Another one is indirect through the food, as I said, the residues of the chemical in the uh, agrochemicals in the food is tested everywhere, even in developing countries like EU, which has very strict rules on the on this, they still test the, um, more than one third of the cereal products contains this pesticides residues. And I I don't know, I'm not uh, the I don't study the real impact of the residues, but I do think it will affect the human health in this way. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so Steve, would you like to ask your question out loud? Can I ask you to? Yeah. Hello. Can yes. you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. My question is what you've described a, a really interesting history of multinational agro industries in China and their changing roles. And I'm wondering whether you're, you could tell a little bit more about whether the story is a story of the changing power and influence of multinational agro-industries in China. 
both English, right? like the corporate trajectories uh, of Chinese firms? You've given us a very good history of noting how international agro-industries have been present in China over the years. And whether or not your story is actually about the, their changing role and that to really understand what's going on, you look at the behavior of international companies and their now either local counterparts or an increasingly dominant Chinese owned capital industry. So perhaps a clarification in terms of foreign owned uh, companies operating in China and the development and introduction with domestic capital. Yep. That could be, is that part, you know, I'd like to hear you talk about that part of the story. In the action of the <coughs> domestic companies and, <coughs> and the foreign companies. <coughs> yes, according to, uh, I will try to uh, briefly introduce a little bit. Um, as I, I say that in China, the development of the whole agrochemical industry is left behind in the beginning. And uh, uh, while the developing of the new active ingredients is mostly, or the or the or the um, or the uh, formulation is uh, as a, before the two, 1990s is largely dominated by the uh, uh, foreign companies, especially those from USA and the European countries where this uh, uh, technology uh, starts or developed, and. Um, and uh, later, when China started to produce the agrochemical, uh, agrochemicals uh, domestically since 1990s, um, uh, most of the research and development is focused on the all of cheap production of the uh, agrochemicals and use the off pattern uh, active ingredients uh, to produce formulas rather than develop new active ingredients. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, the, this sector at the beginning is very largely associated with the uh, pattern politics globally. So the price is very high to produce uh, the, uh, the, the price of the agrochemicals. So China as a, as a beginning, instead of to, um, to uh, produce more expensive or more uh, environment friendly agrochemicals just to produce cheap uh, products in the 1990s. But um, uh, in the, in the two, after 2000, because more and more private companies engaged in, and also the state policy also offers the uh, uh, privilege the, the tax policies, and uh, China then become the largest supplier of cheap uh, active ingredients globally. Um, later, after 2013, Chinese companies seek to upgrade from the cheap AI producers to a more advanced uh, the formulation developer and the producer. This also aligned with uh, why some Chinese companies started to uh, um, acquire large international companies, which they already have a lot of uh, uh, patent uh, active ingredients or formulations. And China has also uh, increased the development investment to uh, study to uh, develop more uh, formulations at this stage nowadays. Also in response to the SSS transformation in the agriculture, uh, in the uh, environment sustainability part. Armand, do you have a question? Uh, thank you. No, uh, thanks, Yunan, uh, also for the presentation, and I also found the framework that you presented like very interesting and, uh, and, uh, and a really nice way to engage with the questions that you raised. Uh, I think my question is a bit similar to the one Xiaohe was asking, is like the nature of capital, right, uh, within the agrochemical complex. So, uh, I, you mentioned that there is both, there is a very uh, high element of state-owned state kind of enterprises, but also increasingly private capital involved, right? Uh, I was wondering maybe also in the context of either if you have an answer or a response or also I mean there's maybe things to consider uh, as you develop the project is, is is there a difference in terms of how these companies actually behave like uh, in terms of uh, 
is there a difference between the Syngenta and, and the private, like, so, sorry, the Sinochem and, and, and the more privately owned uh, companies in terms of either the agrochemicals they produce or in terms of how they interact with global markets? Uh, what are the key markets that they are kind of exporting to or are they more focused on the domestic market? Just to get a sense of how kind of, you know, state-owned versus private ownership within the agrochemical complex may impact also how uh, these companies are engaging and, and like their behavior right in the market and maybe just link to this is that second question of then labor right uh, <coughs> so is is the agrochemical you, you mentioned that the the initial kind of uh, uh, development and the kind of expansion phase was uh, companies actually setting up for cheap labor right and, and focused on more right, and like chemicals uh, uh, like uh, base, base chemicals if I understood it correctly uh, but as kind of labor prices and, and, and like labor becomes more expensive in China, right? How is it then affecting the functioning of these industries? Uh, are, are kind of Chinese agrochemical companies still dependent on a cheap supply of labor or, or, or have they moved on to say higher value or, or that move to kind of higher value agrochemicals? Has that then meant that now they don't really need necessarily a cheap supply of labor in that sense so so maybe just like in the context of thinking of this political economic uh, dimensions of it right like how to how to capital labor like differences also affect uh, how kind of companies are, are navigating that process yeah uh, thanks so much Ahmad for your questions and uh, um, uh, yeah, this actually has a lot of uh, small questions and I will try to uh, give my answers at this stage and uh, um, as to the, uh, as you say that um, uh, the different, uh, like the state-owned or big companies or small-scale companies, uh, we do see that they, uh, they have different trajectory in reality on the ground in the industrial because uh, those small uh, scale uh, f uh, firms, especially those who produce cheap uh, active ingredients, um, uh, they, most of uh, they, they, uh, and for the big companies, they produce more like the Syngenta and they are able to produce more expensive, more expensive uh, uh, products based on the active ingredients, the new formulas mm -hmm. rather than the raw material. Active ingredients is more like raw materials mm -hmm. and, um, and it usually it's of pattern ones and uh, Syngenta can produce more pattern ones. Yeah, yeah. And uh, because they have a lot of resources and uh, because they already have the pattern of the several. So when they produce, they don't need to pay the patent fee. So they do, they have, they do have different uh, markets. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also some are aimed at the uh, foreign export, while some is more, even some of the companies is, is only specialized in exporting. Mm -hmm. According to our understanding, some companies, their product is mm, mainly for the export, while some is for the domestic usage. So there's different kind of, uh, there are differentiation among the companies. Uh, and I, uh, as to the state capital, and uh, I, uh, according to my current understanding, because I, uh, the state-owned companies, in some extent, is similar capital. As for my understanding, I understand the state-owned company as similar uh, capital because they have the features of the capital. Mm -hmm. as a companies because they also kept uh, profit driven but on the other hand they have more uh, privilege like the state uh, loans or different kind of uh, policy preferences and uh, support and uh, they also according to the role of China these companies when they see us they also need to benefit the development of the uh, community like they need to uh, take the responsibility of the trainings they need to do more these kind of tasks according when they do the business mm -hmm. as a separate. So it's more semi capital, but they also uh, have the profit driven aim, mm -hmm. according to my understanding. And um, as you say, the changing of the, as you say, the labor market is changing in China. Uh, it's more expensive. And uh, as I also say, the China, the industry in China is also seeking the transition at mm -hmm. this moment, mm -hmm. like uh, to upgrade from the cheap AI producer to more advanced, more, uh, have more technology backed um, formula developer and produce at this stage. I think this is aligned because of the labor cost is increased, so they seek the restructuring of the whole industry. And this is 
upgrade, they call it upgrade. Uh, so just to wrap up, I think what it seems very clear is that, uh, um, sorry, is there a digitalization and mechanization. Oh, well, let's do this as a final, final, final question because we are running out of time. Um, there's a question, how and in what ways do agrochemical companies incorporate aspects of digitalization or mechanization in China? And can you kindly read the question? Yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for this question. Actually, this is a very uh, big question because it's linked with the current trend of digitalization and mechanization. And this, I also read uh, the current uh, some studies or reports about this uh, because, as I said, the uh, the China's uh, current policy about to reduce the uh, in two thousand in two thousand fifteen the new policy on the reduce zero growth of the chemical fertilizers and uh, in, in the use of the chemical fertilizer and pesticide by 2020, the action uh, issued by the agriculture ministry in China in 2050. Actually, within this action, one of the measurements they proposed is to uh, promote the standardized and uh, the digitalization and mechanization, they call it the more digitalized way of spray of the pesticide. They believe this is can reduce the uh, uh, chemical usage and uh, to prevent the overuse of a chemical. This is one of the one of the response towards the overuse of the agrochemical by the state and also some uh, specialists. So this is very uh, linked with current current uh, development in rural China. There's a lot of collectives and uh, specialized uh, in the uh, machine spraying, like the, they call it the precise agriculture or smart agriculture, that they want to control the use of the uh, pesticides. Uh, this is very still very new, and I see it is only happening in these two years in China in agriculture, but normally in the large scale farms, not the small scale farms. And I do think this will shape significantly the farming practice in the future, and this is one of the topics I want to trace. Yeah. Thank you so much. What I, what I feel um, is happening is that there's a, a growing interest to understand, for those of us uh, that are not uh, specialists on China, understand China better, <coughs> an imperative to understand China better. And it's um, a bit telling that in your literature review, the vast majority of the contributions seem to come from very mainstream agricultural economics, and there's so little written on the power relations and a truly political economy understanding of these very transformative uh, processes. So this, I think, is an invitation for you and others working on these topics to submit to the Journal of Agrarian Change. Uh, thank you, Yunnan, uh, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. And thanks everybody for joining us. <coughs> and this is just a reminder that our next seminar takes place on the 12th of March. It's co-hosted by Wageningen University and the UCL Institute of the Americas in the United Kingdom. And the presenter is Alberto Alonso Fradejas, uh, who happens to be also an ISS alumni. And um, the moderator will be Kes Janssen. Uh, the title of that presentation is Agrarian Extractivism. What is it and why does it matter? Uh, also, uh, for more information about this seminar series, to sign up for an um, mailing list and our newsletter, uh, please do um, join or visit uh, the, agrarian, um, the Agrarian Questions uh, website um, that you will have a link to in, in, in your notes, but otherwise it's aqs.org.uk. And thanks everybody who joined us uh, here live, and thanks um, to um, that uh, very large and, and active audience. I think we had a very interesting session, and I'm really looking forward to, to a paper on these very topics that I think are ever more important. So we'll see you uh, soon from Wageningen, and um, thanks um, to everybody. Thank you. Thank you.